And there can be no holiday making. During the Second World War, there was a job for almost everyone who wanted one. I'll ask to keep the workshops active. You must not waste one single hour or even one single minute. The government wanted to extend that industriousness to peacetime. Maintaining full employment became a key objective of economic policy, spelt out in the 1945 Full Employment White Paper. Absolutely central to the white paper we are releasing today is a secure, fairly paid job for everyone who wants one and a qualified worker for every employer who needs one. In today's economy, unemployment is sitting at 3.7% and has been below four since April. Lows that haven't been seen since the post-war boom that followed the first white paper. The new white paper says there's still great untapped potential around three million Australians who aren't working or want to work more hours. We are seeing roadblocks to work. Roadblocks to work for, for employers, roadblocks to work for employees. Over the next 10 years, digital technology jobs will grow by 21%, care economy jobs by 22%, and jobs in the clean energy workforce by 30%. A new migration strategy due within weeks will deal with the entry of temporary migrants, many of whom come to Australia based on a skills list the White Paper says is outdated and slow to adapt. Among permanent migrants, nearly all dentists, medical practitioners and physios are working in their nominated job. But for accountants and some types of engineers, it's less than half. The highest skilled workers that we need to help lift the productivity of Australian workers were having the most difficulties coming to the country. Treasurer, welcome to 7.30. Thanks, Sarah. If the employment white paper really is a, a roadmap for a much more dynamic labour market, what are the first steps? Well, we've said today in making uh, nine initial policy announcements with a big focus really on training, on lifelong learning, reskilling and retraining, but also smoothing it out and making it easier for people to work a bit more if they'd like to, whether that's older workers or people who might be worried about getting back into the labour market if it means losing some of their concessions uh, or entitlements. And so what we've done today in releasing this uh, white paper on employment, a white paper on jobs and opportunities, is to say this is really all about making it easier for workers to find opportunities and making it easier for employers to find workers so that we can prosper together. The big question is whether this is going to move quickly enough for those areas of the economy that are changing so fast, the digital transition, the green transition and the care economy as well, of course. Is there enough here to make it go quickly enough? Yes, there is, but it's important to remember that this isn't the beginning of our uh, employment policies and it's not the end either. In the pages of this employment white paper, there's something like 70 policies that we've implemented to go to some of these issues you have identified. And it also aligns really neatly with the work that other ministers are doing on migration, on the skills agreement, the universities accord, the gender equality strategy. There's a whole bunch of work going on right across the Albanese cabinet to make sure that we position our people to be beneficiaries of change, not victims of change. And one of the most important ways that we are doing that is to recognise that we need workers in the net zero transformation, in the care and support economy, in the tech sector. And that's why so much of what we are proposing here, particularly when it comes to lifelong learning, is about training the workers for those good, secure, fairly paid jobs, uh, which will be such a feature of those three areas that we've identified. Now, there is a plan here to fast track new TAFE centres of excellence and to develop new higher level apprenticeships. How will these change the pathways for people acquiring much higher level technical skills? Well, Sarah, whether it's those two policies that you've identified or the uh, digital skills passport, uh, what they are really all about is recognising that in years gone by, somebody might finish school and get an extra qualification from TAFE or uni or in some other way, and that would sustain people through 40 or 50 years of their working life. And that's changing. As the economy changes and the pace of change picks up, 
We need to instill in Australians a culture of lifelong learning and retraining and reskilling. And in order to do that, we've got to get the systems more effectively joined up. And I pay tribute to Jason Clare and Brendan O'Connor. This is a real passion of theirs and a real passion of the government. The different parts of the system need to be able to interact with each other much more easily so that people can catch up with the skills that they need and keep up as our economy changes. And that really is uh, one of the central concerns of this employment white paper. There's a big focus here on disadvantage and the paper makes the point that the Labor government in 2008 set targets for poorer students getting university degrees. Those targets weren't met. The same was true for vocational training targets. How do we know it's going to be different this time? Well, in the specific, if you look at a lot of the announcements that Jason Clare has made, including the initial announcements out of the university's accord, that is about getting students from uh, disadvantaged areas and from disadvantaged cohorts uh, into the higher education system. And, and, and that is such an important thing uh, that we are doing. But more broadly, you know, there's five objectives in this employment white paper, and one of them is about overcoming barriers. And that is to recognise that even in a country where unemployment in aggregate has been incredibly low, and it's currently 3.7%, extremely low by historical standards, but there are still pockets of disadvantage and long-term unemployment. And where that concerns us most is where that disadvantage and unemployment cascades through the generations, including, frankly, uh, in communities like the one that I represent. And so this is personal for a lot of us. You know, we need to get much better. It shouldn't be beyond us as a country, Sarah, uh, when we've got unemployment as low as it has been, to recognise that not everybody uh, has been able to grasp those opportunities uh, of a labour market which has been historically strong and so we need to do more work there and we are and that's why it really is one of the central concerns of this employment white paper. How important is it for the government to come up with its own definition and its own goals of what full employment is, especially when the new head of the Reserve Bank has said that unemployment is too low and needs to rise to fight inflation? Well first of all I think Governor Bullock uh, was saying that her uh, expectation, the Reserve Bank's expectation and indeed the Treasury's expectation uh, is that unemployment unfortunately will tick up a bit uh, as our economy slows and weakens because of China and the impact of interest rate rises. But she, she wasn't, uh, and she wasn't just... happening at the same excuse time. Excuse me, it wasn't just a forecast. She was saying that a slightly higher rate of unemployment was a sustainable balance point. Do you agree with her that that is a sustainable balance point? Well, I agree that uh, her, with her expectation that unemployment will tick up and inflation is moderating. But I think the core of your question, Sarah, uh, is about how low can we have unemployment without putting upward pressure on prices? Uh, and that is a really important consideration, but it's a, it's a, a necessarily uh, quite a narrow and technical assumption that the Reserve Bank uses and the Treasury uses. And what I've tried to do in this employment white paper is to say that that is necessary, that's important, but distinct from that and complementary to that is the government's objective. And the government's objective is a good, secure, fairly paid job for everyone who wants one without having to look for too long. That's why we need our economy to be more productive and dynamic and innovative and competitive. It's why we're putting so much time and effort and resources uh, into investing in an economy where the skills base is better, we're transforming our energy system, we're adapting and adopting technology, all of these sorts of things will lift the speed limit on our economy, employ more people, create more opportunities without pushing inflation up. Now, in publishing the secret messages of Mike Pizzullo, the uh, head of the Home Affairs Department, Nine Media appears to have pulled back the curtain to reveal the extent of his political manoeuvring uh, during the years of the coalition government, I should say. Are we seeing for the first time how deeply enmeshed in politics some senior public servants are? Well, I think it's really important that Mike Pizzullo has stood aside uh, and especially important that Minister O'Neill and the Prime Minister uh, have, rever have referred this really serious matter to the uh, Public Service Commissioner uh, who has appointed someone to review what's happened here. Uh, and before we get that advice, that advice will be provided to Minister O'Neill. Before we get that, I think it would be inappropriate for me to get into the details of it. But obviously it's been sufficiently concerning uh, that uh, Secretary Pizzullo has stood aside. 
uh, and that Minister O'Neill and the Prime Minister have referred this to the Public Service Commissioner. I think that's a really important step that has been taken. They will get to the bottom of it. Uh, and I'm reluctant to, to really add much to that until we see what they advise. But really concerning, as you say, Jim Chalmers, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Much appreciated, Sarah.